brothers and sisters in Christ, on this blessed Sunday, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Please rise for our hymn of praise.
Let us pray together. Great and gracious God, you are the center of our worship, for you alone are God, the Holy One. We rejoice in you, Lord, because you are the source and giver of abundant life. We thank you for your great mercy and love that granted us salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you as well for your daily blessings, for hearing our prayers, for healing our diseases, for helping us out of our troubles, for instructing us on how to live at peace with you and with others. Lord God, we desire to follow you, to love you in return, to glorify your name, but at times we fail. Hear our prayer and forgive us. Father, we thank you for forgiving us and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Help us grow in wisdom and discernment and to learn to choose your ways. Help us to worship you in the spirit and in truth. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Easter. The scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 47 to 50. Let us read responsibly. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thanks be to God for his words of truth and life. biblical reflection today from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13 is commonly called the parable of the net. If you have your Bibles with you, you can open with me to the 13th chapter of Matthew and you will see that this chapter records seven parables of Jesus. Namely, the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parables of the mustard seed and the yeast, the parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl, and lastly, the parable of the net. Just to review what a parable is, it comes from the Greek word, which means to place alongside, to lay beside sa Tagalog pa, kung itabi, na itatabi ang isang bagay sa isang bagay. So, parables is teaching by means of telling stories which are about simple everyday objects or situations that are very familiar to the audience and yet they hold a deeper spiritual lesson, truth, or principle. And so this made Jesus' teachings more catchy, easier to remember for the listeners, and relatable among the people across various cultures and generations. And that is why they still are very relevant and interesting in our day. Bible scholars count more than 40 parables, four zero, 40 parables, of Jesus recorded in the New Testament and about 13 of these were about the kingdom of heaven. We remember that in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus was about to begin his public ministry he said repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So that was his, his commitment to teach the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Now you will notice that the seven parables in Matthew chapter 13 are all about the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus begins each story with a phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like so and so. And so he lays an everyday situation which gives the listeners, the listeners of his time and ours, a glimpse of the nature of the kingdom of heaven one truth at a time, one principle at a time, one insight at a time. Now, of the seven parables that we see in Matthew 13, two of them talk about the end of the age or the day when God pronounces his judgment to all people. 
and peoples. Now let us look into the features of the parable of the net and learn what insights about the kingdom of God we may, may be able to place beside the literal story that is being narrated by Jesus to help us understand our life as children of the kingdom of God and prepare us for the coming end of the age. Now, there are at least three main features in the storyline. First, a net let down into the lake containing all kinds of fish. Second, the fishermen pull up the net when it is full. And the third, the fishermen collected the good fish into baskets but threw the bad fish away. There you go. That's an example of a modern day scene somewhere in a body of water. I believe this is a Greek uh, fishing boat. We can picture such a as a scene happening not only by the Lake of Galilee in Jesus' time, but even today in almost all fishing areas of the world. Now fishermen using nets let down their nets into the waters, pull them into their boats when the nets are full, and then they sort their catch when they get back to the shore or sometimes even when they are still in the boat. So this is what is happening right now. These two fishermen with the nets behind them and then the fish all are laid on the uh, floor of the boat. But what they're doing is sorting the fish, their catch. Now, in this particular case, the fishermen are sorting the fish that have commercial value, and so they put them into the baskets, and then those that are dead or are useless commercially are thrown away. Sometimes they throw them back into the sea, back into the sea. Now, okay, so the first feature is a net let down into the lake containing all kinds of fish. In the lake, there are all kinds of fish, and the net is let down. We can say that this means God's word is preached in the world for people to hear and receive. The lake is the world, and the fish are the people. That is why Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. Um, the net is the gospel, and of course, God's word in scriptures that is made available for all so that they can come to the knowledge of the truth about God and his saving love and be able to live in the spirit, be born again, to live their lives as God had meant them to live, and as the choir said, to love our God, the reason we live. And of course, to learn about the nature of people. Generally, their need to receive that love from God in order to be saved from the problem and penalty of sin. Many ignore the truth. Some oppose the truth and reject it. Others become curious, but remain non-committal. Still others follow only what is comfortable to them, and the rest devote their lives to God and to following Jesus as their Lord. Among those who align themselves with the Christian faith or with Christianity, we could say that some were born into parents who profess to be Christians, and so they were brought to church and they consider themselves Christians. Now others could have been originally of another faith or were non-religious. They had no, uh, no influence at all, no idea, no desire for things of the spirit or anything religious. But at some point of their lives, they were influenced by their schoolmates, 
their co-workers, friends, and they joined that Christian group. Eventually, these believers join a church where they may be regular members and they participate in the ministries. Now, still others get into the church for other reasons, for reasons other than deepening their faith and devotion to Jesus. Well, there could be a, a whole gamut of reasons. Perhaps some come to church to conform to social expectations because that is what uh, supposedly the decent people do. Perhaps some come to church to keep a family tradition. Some to widen their network of connections. And some for unsavory reasons which are better left not mentioned. And increasingly as the world nears the end, there are those who are deceived by the evil one. And uh, they receive the word, and then they distort the word of God, lead others to a false gospel, or they themselves fall for the cults that stray from the message of Jesus as he taught them to his apostles. So we're talking here of the true gospel, that the apostolic message, the apostolic message, in other words, the message that was truly received by the apostles as we read them and perceive and interpret them from the scriptures and the false gospel, gospels, um, teachings that stray, you know? some stray to a very wide, from a, a, to a very wide and distance, but some also can be very um, deceptive because they they, they feel like, they hear, they, they sound like, they use biblical words, but those who are really seated in scriptures can tell the difference, okay? So, of course, Jesus also says that by their fruits you will know them, okay? Now, the world also contains the church made up of people of various kinds who come in and go who are of various stages of maturity, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And so this reminds us that we are all a work in progress towards Christ-likeness, fish in different, at different levels of maturity. But at the same time, Christians, believers, are given spiritual gifts to be used for helping each other persevere and grow in faith. And at the same time, to, be, to enable them to be blessed by each other's service. We bless one another as we render service for each other. It can be a service of various kinds, depending on the need, depending on our giftings. And of course, we come together to share what we have enjoyed from the abundant life in Christ. So this is what it's like for the fish to be in the lake and the net to be let down. Now the second analogy, the fishermen pull up the net when it is full. There is a day of judgment at the end of the age. Both the Old and the New Testaments teach about the end of this world as we know it. When Jesus Christ returns to earth as a righteous judge to decide the eternal destiny and rewards of every person. Now Jesus likens the pulling up of the net to a day of harvest. And uh, you know, the pulling up of the net like a day of harvest, as we can see in the parable of the weeds, which is also, uh, which we find in Matthew chapter 13. Both of these graphic illustrations refer to the end of the age, the harvesting. Now in the parable of the weeds, the undesirable weeds, grew along with the good seeds which had begun to sprout, which were planted on the soil. Now, 
According to that parable, the farm, the farm servants thought it might be good to pull out the weeds right away to keep the farm clean because after all, they were not contributing to the harvest. They were, they were shall we say, they were just um, uh, sharing in the nutrients of the soil, but they were not really bearing any fruit that would be useful to the people. And so... The owner was asked, would you want us to, to, also, to now pull out those weeds? And he said, no, let them grow together because in pulling out, you might be uprooting the wheat with them. Just wait until the time of harvest. Now the prophet Joel calls it the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That is the day of the harvest, the end of the age can be a great and dreadful day. It will be a great and glorious day for some, but a terribly dreadful day for others, depending on the kind of life they lived. Now, next we have the third and last picture analogy. The fishermen collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This last statement was explained by Jesus himself. And that is why we can, we can interpret the first two because he, he did explain the last and he said, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I heard a commentary um, recently that in that blazing furnace, a, a, situ a state where we don't want to be, to be, definitely, there will be weeping for those who, uh, who are extremely regretful for how they have not made the right decision. So they are weeping, sadness. But there will also be some who will be gnashing their teeth, meaning to say all the way to that eternal punishment, they will be opposing the truth of Jesus Christ and the authority of God. Now, the fishermen represent the angels of God who will execute his judgment. So it is the angels who will gather them and they know uh, how they will be set, how they will be distributed either to the right side or the left side we are told that the wicked will have a dreadful time while the righteous will live in God's eternal presence in glory in the parable of the weeds Jesus said that the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father in the parable of the bags of gold, Jesus talked about rewards for the righteous on the last day. He said, we are told here that the king will, will say to the righteous, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The stewardship of the redeemed together with his rewards will be that of being given more uh, this time glorious responsibilities because God's because uh, Jesus said you are to be in charge of many things so in that in a place of glory there will be a lot of uh, productive beautiful glorious things to do we are not going to be just sitting around doing nothing and um, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, Jesus spoke of judgment for the unrighteous goats as the eternal punishment while the righteous sheep will be brought to eternal life. So these time and time again, many times Jesus, using all sorts of illustrations, wanted to drive the truth across. God is a righteous judge. He possesses complete knowledge, perfect understanding, and precise fairness 
in everything, in carrying out his spiritual and moral laws that he has made known to all people through his word. He is perfectly in control. He rewards what is good and punishes evil. God is also true. We can expect him to do just as he said he would. Many people do not take his word seriously because they think they will get away with it. Yes, perhaps for a time, or maybe even for the whole lifetime, they get away with it. The punishment does not come right away, or the punishment seems to be, bear to be bearable, and so they continue on with their pride and arrogance and mockery. As Jesus said, the weeds will not be pulled out before the harvest. We will, they will continue to be here in this world. Thankfully, because of God's patience with them, with us, some learn their lessons when they experience the consequences of their wickedness. Sadly, others do not. Even we Christians do not take God's commands seriously in certain areas of our lives. There is no way any of us can escape God's righteous judgment, but all of us can come to his mercy seat. There is no mercy and love to talk about if there is no justice. Jesus said, there is a way. There is a way for sinners like us. There is a way to the Father. He said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one will, will enter the kingdom of heaven except through Jesus Christ. Now, although we have sinned against the Holy God countless times, even after our rebirth, and we still do. He is a God of mercy who will pardon and cleanse those who will accept his offer of salvation to believe and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is our faith in God's word. As we grow in our knowledge of him and become more intimate with our Lord, we experience this love even more and learn to love him in return. The faith becomes uh, a matter of mental assent. Yes, we know. We can reason it out. We can even feel it now. We feel that love. Why? Because our hearts continue to be softened by God's love. So how could we not love the God who has given the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, and forgiven us and continues to forgive our sins on account of that sacrifice. For us who have received the gift of salvation, how are we using this gift? This is the gift of grace. Are we good stewards of God's grace? Now, faithful stewardship of that grace is living out God's commands and principles with full devotion. That is what faithful stewardship means. Now, there are two, there are two kinds of righteousness here that we can discern from God's word and how all of these spiritual things work. First, our, our salvation is God's gift of righteousness to us. There is nothing we can do to be righteous in God's sight. It is his gift because of Christ. In the words of, in the theological language, he imputes his righteousness to us. It's as if he makes us wear his clothes, his clothes, clothes of righteousness. And that is what the Father sees. Now, the second kind of righteousness is our stewardship 
of that grace. Our stewardship is the righteousness we live out for God's glory. Yes, we are righteous in God's sight because of Jesus Christ, we are saved, but we are also working out that salvation through righteous living. That is the stewardship of God's righteousness or the stewardship of God's grace. And so how are we in both? I believe many, if not all of us here, who have been members a long time, and I know you have been through membership classes and our retreats, you know you have received Jesus Christ. That is your first righteousness. God's gift to you and to me. Salvation. But there is a second type. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only those but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say on that day, meaning to say the end of the age, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, many today are concerned about the signs of the end of the age. Curious about what will occur prior to that day and when this will occur. Of course, we know from the Bible and from Jesus' words that no one knows the day. Only the Father knows when. And in his teachings, Jesus thought more about preparing for the end of the age than just simply knowing the signs. We will not be mere spectators on that day, but we will be among those who will be judged. The Apostle Paul said that salvation is an indescribable gift. Indeed. But at the same time, he said, we should run the race of life in such a way as to get the prize. And not only to escape eternal punishment by the skin of our teeth. God desires to give rewards to his children. Because this is for his glory. We will shine like the sun. Because it is God who will allow us to shine because of his glory. And on that day, whatever crowns we receive, the prizes, the rewards that the, the righteous judge will give us, we shall lay at the feet of the Lamb of God. And so the song goes to him, crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne. That means to say we are going to offer to God the crowns that he has given to us. To him who died for us and hail him as our matchless king through all eternity. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, thank you first of all for your patience with us and with the world. It is because of your kindness, O oh Lord, and your loving patience that you have finally reached us and we have reached out to you, O oh God, by your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your great salvation. We, we think about our loved ones, some of our friends, whom you said, O oh God, we also have to face that day we pray for them, O oh Lord, if they haven't yet received you. 
There are those who are misled, those who are following a false gospel that will prevent them from believing what is true and therefore prevent them from doing what is right. We ask, O oh God, for your mercy. We ask, Lord, that you will intervene even in our efforts to reach out to them. Thank you, O oh Lord God, also for your Holy Spirit who is with us. You have granted us your mighty, comforting, and truth-bearing spirit that we may understand your words, which are simple enough to those who are open to receive the truth, and yet deep, deep enough to truly transform us from glory to glory. Lord, I pray that uh, we will not sit on our gift of salvation and righteousness that we have received from you, not to sit on our laurels, but to press on. Not because we are forced to, but because we are walking in step with your spirit, because you have changed our desires, Lord, to be in accordance with your will, because you have put that great love into our hearts that can only respond in like manner to you, O oh Lord. Father, I pray that all of us will truly be faithful stewards of this gift of grace, of our limited time in this world, so that we will enjoy limitless, eternal glory with you. Father, today we also would like to pray for our church that through our ministries, the varied ministries that will contribute, Lord, to evangelism, to missions, we will in some way be able to lead others, O oh God, to the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be able to share the gospel. We will be able to let down the net of your word. And we pray, O oh God, that through our discipleship and our prayers, when the net is pulled up, they will be counted and considered as good and valuable fish, meant, O oh God, for, for your glory in the life to come. Thank you so much, O oh Lord. Father, we also would like to pray for our brothers and sisters in other Christian churches. We know, O oh Lord, that as with all of the churches now, we are undergoing a lot of challenges. Some are even under persecution, going through a lot of uh, trials for various reasons. Lord, we pray that they will stand firm, firmly upon the faith of their fathers, the faith that is solidly anchored in the apostolic teachings in, in step with the Holy Spirit. We pray especially, Lord, for the churches which are now in the midst of war-torn countries. We know, O oh God, that no matter how, how small they may be, especially in unreached people groups, you have placed your word there somehow, O oh God. And we pray that they will remain strong, that they will multiply, and that our church may even be part of spreading the gospel, Lord, here and far away. Lord, please also allow us to shine our light as um, your followers, Lord Jesus, in the various spheres of influence where you have placed us, the youth among their friends and peers, the young adults, and the rest, O oh Lord, in our workplace, in our families, as well as in our circles of associations. And we pray, Lord, that even the elderly, those who are in the twilight years of their life, Lord, will continue to remain strong, will strive to end well, O oh Lord God. This is for the glory of your name. Lord, we remember those who are now suffering from all kinds of, uh, of troubles, physical, 
emotional, even work-related troubles at home, troubles at school, troubles with people that they meet or work with. Lord, we pray that uh, we will be able to find comfort as well as wisdom in discerning how to live our lives proactively and even how we, we react to situations that are outside of our control. Father, thank you that we have your word that we can trust. And we know, O oh Lord, your Holy Spirit will keep us, will restrain us as well as propel us to do that which is right and pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible declares, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver.
please stand for our prayer. Dear God, we give this to you through the ministry of our church. Bless this gift so that we may at all times have all that we need to do your mission and abound in every good work. May our endeavors be towards the sharing of the gospel, the strengthening of faith, and the building of transformed lives in Christ. All for the praise and glory of your holy name. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, set your hearts on things above as God's chosen people. Whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. The peace, love, and joy of the Lord be with you always. To the glory of his holy name, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's people say,
praise the Lord. Praise God indeed for this beautiful day.